reactive. It was all the <coughs> oxygen was either in CO2 or water or <coughs> minerals. And most minerals have oxygen in it. Oxygen is the third most common element in the universe, <coughs> although it falls far behind helium and uh, uh, what is it? Uh, hydrogen. And but it's the third most common, and it's the most common element in the crust of the Earth, and on the Earth as a whole, it's 30% of all atoms of oxygen. But it wasn't in the atmosphere, and you can't have eukaryotes living if there's not oxygen to run their system, um, to burn their calories. Uh, and what it was was CO2. We started off with about 100 times the density of CO2 that we have now. Uh, just like Venus started. But for us it was better because we were farther from the sun. And at that time the sun was only 70% as intense as it is now. So the CO2 at that time was actually good because it kept water on. It would have been, uh, well, it, it would have been frozen otherwise if it didn't contain the heat. Now another thing that uh, blue-green algae got us, another bacteria do too, is we've got to have nitrogen. And nitrogen is the opposite of oxygen. Oxygen is so reactive, it wasn't available. It was all bound in things. And nitrogen is so unreactive, because it's got triple binding between those two um, atoms. You have three, sharing three electrons, and it's very hard. It's just not reactive. But the bacteria, and especially cyanobacteria, and fix the nitrogen, which means it turns, it <coughs> breaks down the two and uh, puts, turns it into nitrates and especially ammonia. And so that's reactive. But the reason we need nitrogen is we could not have any heredity without DNA and RNA, and that caused that necessary nitrogen. And also, proteins make up so much of what we do and what we are, <coughs> we need nitrogen for that. So the cyanobacteria actually freed the oxygen for life, and it actually fixed the nitrogen. And without that, we would have no more, not, well, we'd have bacteria, anaerobic bacteria. This is just, <coughs> as you know this very well, the uh, blue-green algae or cyanobacteria takes the lots of CO2 in the air and lots of water, thank heavens for the way the earth started, and with energy from photosynthesis, it's kind of like you push in a big spring and you put all the energy into the um, carbohydrates and free oxygen. And this has got a lot of energy stored and this is very reactive, so you just breathe the oxygen, respiration, and burn it back and it goes back into this. You know that. It's like pushing a spring and then getting released. Now, the reason we're talking about cyanobacteria is they were the first reef builders way back, and that's some of the evidence that they were so far back, is calcium carbonate was deposited like uh, corals do. And corals are much faster producers of volumes of reef, but they had billions of years before there were any animals. And you can still see these are called stromatolites. I don't know if you need to remember that. But what they are is reefs made by cyanobacteria. And it's just a byproduct. I think they're not, of course, purposefully, speaking teleologically, they're not making those reefs <coughs> on purpose, but it's just a byproduct of photosynthesis and what we're the environment. Here's some more uh, pictures of stromatolus. Here's fossil stromatolus with a hammer. <coughs> now, what happened is the 3.8 billion years ago, cyanobacteria were producing oxygen, but it's a very slow process, and they're very in kind of uh, the world and atmosphere is a big place. But about two and a half billion years ago, a little about two billion years ago, the evidence shows that's when a big iron deposits, the banded iron in Michigan and places like around the world where you get your iron, it all came out of solution because the iron in the ocean uh, was oxidized and turned into rust, and it was settled down. So we know that there was the ocean was getting pretty much saturated with oxygen to what it normal about here. And about here, 
we started getting eukaryotes, which means animals <coughs> and plants, or not animals necessarily, but that, that had to live on a higher octane fuel. They can't live in anaerobic conditions. And so we started getting uh, <coughs> eukaryotes here. And algae came in here. I mean, what we normally think of as algae rather than that cyanobacteria. And so it started producing more and more. And about here is when animals came. And then at this period, there was a tremendous amount of oxygen. And that's when plants started coming out on land. And there was a lot of production of plant life. So the herbivores must not have been evolved to be very efficient at the time. There's a tremendous amount of production. When you got a tremendous amount of production, then you got a lot of oxygen. Probably not many herbivores. And nobody says that's why, but I think it must be. Because why aren't there that many plants now? It's because we're eating them all. But oxygen went up. And when oxygen goes way up, the CO2 goes way down. And what that means, it's going to be very cold if you don't have much CO2. <coughs> and so this is where there was an ice age, is in the Carboniferous. One thing I think is very interesting about this, that's the only time where we had like 30% of the atmosphere was oxygen. The insects got huge. I've seen the Field Museum in Chicago when I was a little kid. Dragonflies were like birds. They're about two, about a foot per wing. And millipedes were like nine feet long, I think. They're gigantic insects. And you can't have that normally because they don't have lungs or gills. The oxygen only gets in through trachea or just a little bit. just kind of oozes in. And so you can't possibly have insects unless there's an awful lot of oxygen. But that was the only one here. The other thing that happened here was there were so many plants and so much oxygen. Now, this I'm just kind of supposing that I don't know this is true. But this is when, this is the fact, when most of our coal was made. And I'm wondering, with that much <coughs> oxygen and that much plant material, there must have been a lot of fires. And that's probably what made the coal, because coal burns better than wood. It burns like charcoal. And so you, you um, now, that's I'm making up a little bit, but it just makes sense because that is where we got our coal from the Carboniferous, and that's why it's called the Carboniferous. Because our coal. Now, uh, let me show you. When the oxygen goes up, you'll look at the next picture, which only, the, the next one starts here. It's only this big. The CO2 goes down, and so here is where you have the Carboniferous. And then after the Carboniferous, it goes up again, but it's generally been going down over billions of years. I mean, it starts way up there. And the reason is that not only did cyanobacteria give us our iron deposits and give us our oxygen and nitrogen, they, uh, the cyanobacteria also gradually got the CO2 out of the atmosphere. So it's kind of like too good to be true. As the CO2 goes down and the sun is warming up, so the sun is now 30% uh, hotter than it was at the start, and the CO2 is just a very tiny fraction, a hundredth of as much. And, and they work very nicely, so it's a very lucky system. And I'm not saying, like, there's a Gaia is, is Mother Earth hypothesis that the Earth is taking care of us. It's not taking care of us. It's given us some tremendous bad times. But that is kind of really nice that the sun's getting hotter as the CO2 is going down. Now we, we got to turn it around. This is not a good idea. Um, okay. So here's the ice ages, and they are the times when there's low CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, the history of Earth. The uh, purple here are, the, this is the uh, number of reefs in the world. And this is uh, the Cambrian, the Ordovician, Silurian, all those things. And we're up here. And this is the very best <coughs> time for reef building that's ever been. But there were two other kinds. Now, these are also called coral. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't finish it. Purple is co coral reefs. Uh, yellow is bivalve reefs, and so on. And then there's uh, <coughs> sponges and the light purple, calcareous sponge reefs. These two are coral, but they're not our coral. They're very different. They look the same. For example, this is a rugos coral, and it kind of looks like a coral. It makes it makes reefs just like corals do. And this is a rugos. That's a whole other class too. But they're not the corals that we have. And one of the differences is 
our corals are radially symmetrical. Although it's an Iberian, it was bilaterally symmetrical. Another thing, and this is important <coughs> for the history of reefs, as you will see, is calcium carbonate, just like water and ice are the same chemically, but they're structured differently as aragonite. And that's a word you should know if they haven't read it, heard it already, that aragonite is the kind of structure of calcium carbonate that we have. And it's, I don't, don't remember these words, but it, it's, it's more squared off. Another thing that's important in it, and this is really key to the future of why reefs are like they are today and why they haven't been in some times in the past, is that calcium carbonate, CaCO3, is uh, calcium carbonate, well, um, limestone. But uh, the aragonite comes with magnesium <coughs> here and there in it. And magnesium is just a, a lower level in the same kind of chemical. So it, it binds the same way, but it's smaller. And this makes the characteristics of aragonite different from calcite. Now aragonite is, and magnesium are scleractinian corals. And they're, uh, I think, the uh, holomida, the green calcareous algae. And to some extent, the uh, crustless coral algae. All these things that we have on reefs are aragonite. However, calcite are those ancient corals that are not related, other than being Nigerian, and a lot of more bivalves and uh, things, you know, uh, calcareous protozoans in the plankton and stuff that are in different, I think. So just a side point about checking back in the history of things. The Earth is gradually slowing down. Don't worry, because it's very, very gradual, but like, um, when the other kind of corals lived in the lower Devonian the four to ten million years ago, which by pure coincidence, you know the rest of it. I don't think I know that. <coughs> it's four hundred and ten million years ago, there were four hundred and ten uh, days in a year. Because it's spinning faster. Uh, and the hours per day were about twenty-two. But um, John Wells, way, way back in the fifties, he's a very important coral reef biology because he was the one who more or less organize the relationship taxonomically of corals and really taught us a lot. But he counted the daily growth rings in those rugosid corals and uh, found it 410. So we always knew that because they, they just calculated physically how fast the Earth must have been going. But it's neat to say yes, the corals show us that it is. Now, why aren't the other kind of corals here anymore? And why aren't the trilobites here? And why aren't the <coughs> here? Is at the Permian, there was the biggest volcano we've ever recorded. And it was at the end of the Permian. And it was about the size of Europe. And in places, the lava was 3,500 meters thick, 3.5 kilometers thick. That's an awful lot of uh, problems with the atmosphere when you have that much um, volcanic action, and because of that, it was the worst mass extinction ever. I think 90 some thousand, or 90 some percent of ocean life was gone. It's amazing though, fragments were pretty widely distributed except for trilobites and the uh, ghost of corals and probably a number of things. But Anyway, here's the tabulated corals and the rugos corals, and they just come to an end at the end of the Permian. Then there's a blank period here, and this was mostly calcitic seas, which uh, I'll get to later, is how much magnesium there is in the water. Remember, if you don't have much magnesium, then you have calcite. And if you have a lot of magnesium, like we do now in the ocean, it's the third next to sodium and chlorine, it's by far the third most abundant. And I think it's the fourth most abundant chemic, uh, element on Earth. Magnesium is very common, but it's common, well, I'm getting very disorganized here. I'll come back up to this. The thing <coughs> is, this is uh, aragonite oceans, and this is calcite oceans, and the calcite corals were killed from something different than the aragonite by that huge atmosphere um, problems caused by a volcano. There's a period here, but all of a sudden, 
a whole variety of corals appears related apparently to uh, Corallomorphariums. And Corallomorphariums are very closely related to our coral sclerocane, but they're a colonial anemone and they don't make skeletons. But corals are different, they make skeletons. And so here's a fossil, one of the earliest fossil sclerocanians. This is a modern fossil, a modern coral, and this is a Corallomorphariums. Uh, for a while, they actually thought Corallomorphariums were in the coral group genetically, but that's been, that, that was a, a false start to what's happening. But what I think is interesting about corals is there were these Corallomorphariums and various um, anemone types, but you, you usually think of something like coral starting and like a tree that uh, branches off the base, the trunk and goes into these branches. But corals started like a field of grass. They all were related. If you go back farther, a person here at the uh, university, uh, our, our department, um, and a graduate student, um, Romano, <coughs> anyway, they, her thesis, Romano, and they, they traced, the, they calculate, they took the DNA from all these different kinds of corals, and they are, have a common ancestor, but it's about 100 million years earlier. Since then, they branched off, and at this time, all of a sudden, all these different kinds of corals evolved into sclerotinians that secreted <coughs> skeletons. And basically, this is 100 million years, roughly 300 million years ago, but 100 million years before these came about 220 some million years ago in the mid-Triassic. So they split off into different kinds and then we started getting corals. They, they came sort of separately. And Wells, the guy I said, sort of organized coral taxonomy and he did the growth <coughs> rate. He also, way back in the 50s, said, these corals come in two groups. They don't have a common ancestor as corals. They may have common ancestor before, but not as corals. And he did this ahead of time, and I really appreciate Romano and uh, Palumbi from here when they discovered this pattern with two main groups, just like Wells said, that, uh, that they, they came in two groups. That all corals didn't come branching off of one tree, as corals, that is. Now, this is just going to be a quick slideshow, but corals are so different in the kinds of polyps they have. Here's one. Now look at this. There's a long bees. Look at those polyps. These polyps. Teeny little polyps. Oh. Big hanging long stem. Now, so many different kinds of polyps, so they evolve all these different ways, but they're still secreting a skeleton. They're basically the same form. And what I, this is just my personal thing I gotta show, even though it's probably not what you should know necessarily. But octocorals are another group. They all have the same kind of polyps. They have eight tentacles, what sort of tiny tentacles like birds. Now some of them, are like bulbs. They, they don't make, they, they have a, calcar a, a proteinaceous rod going up this little, but they, they burrow in the sand. Now that's a very different kind of polyp. And that, this is a close up, but they still have the same kind of polyps. Then you have all kinds of fans and whips and stuff. By the way, this is typical of a Caribbean reef. Those of you who've been diving in the Caribbean, this is what you see. You come out in the Pacific. Now we have that kind of thing too, but this is more typical. And why in the world is it? It's just maybe just the way things went. You know, big leathery things can just take vast areas of very heavy leathery coral. <coughs> then you have these various forms. I'm going to go through this. And you even have a coral, an oct octocoral with polyps just like the others. It's making a calcareous skeleton, or a calcium carbonate skeleton, just like this reef building coral that we slurred in. And then you have some that just go out on little runners without any kind of So the point is the polyps are all the same, but you have all these different life forms. And corals are the opposite. The polyps are so variable, but you only have one life form. And I think that's curious. 
another thing about it is, oh, here's another sort of thing that even these have an internal, not skeleton, but they have little spicules in the tissue of calcium carbonate, and they plant those down into a very firm reef. So some soft, uh, soft, uh, soft corals like this can make reefs. And in fact, in American Samoa, there's one they drilled down is 40 meters thick, which means 120 feet thick of just spicules. <coughs> this, is, this is on Guam. So I'm just saying, octocorals are very different. They come arrive. But this is the most interesting. Corals started in around 220 million years ago, and they've changed quite a bit since was to that. But uh, these are spicules of one of those that was making that reef I showed you. That's uh, Fimularia. This is from the um, Silurian. So this is about 400 million years ago, twice as far old as any coral, and just as old as the Rugos coral. And look how similar they are. They just don't change. And the polyps probably have been those eight tentacles for 400 million years, where our polyps are going to go all over the place. Now, um, when reefs are spreading fast, then uh, the sea level goes way up because not only is the water uh, warm because of all of the CO2 being put off by the volcanoes and stuff making it, but just like uh, the, the hot basalt lifts things up. So this is interesting in the Cretaceous when we had the Tyrannosaurus and stuff. Look at North America had a waterway all the way through here, most of North Africa. There was only 19% of the earth was above water. Um, now, boy, right, this is sort of a side thing. When all of the reefs were pretty much interconnected, but then when the Atlantic Ocean started getting formed and started moving away here, the Caribbean area got isolated from the Tethys. Area. And what I thought was really interesting with DNA on evolution of corals is we, up until a few years ago, thought all of these were in one family, or at least up to here, were in one family, the uh, Fabiidae. So genetics they did on them found out uh, none of them are Fabiidae. Fabiidae are here in the Pacific, but and out there too. The Fabiidae existed. But like this one looks like this one. But this one's related to these two in the mirror lineage. This one looks like this. This looks like this. But these are just co-evolved. And why in the world they do that? Um, anyway, that's a side point. Now, when the high rate of spreading, you get all of that lava being formed and pushing the, making new basalt and pushing away, this absorbs the magnesium. And so when the, when the continents are moving fast, <coughs> then you get uh, a lot of high CO2, but uh, mag magnesium ratio goes way down. There's not much magnesium in the water because it's taken up by the new lava, uh, the new basalt. And when it slows down, like now, the continents are moving, but they're awfully slow right now. I mean, you're not going to go and watch the continents move. It's very slow. And this is good because Magnesium is very common in the ocean now, and this is good for corals. It's never been better for corals in, in, as far as the ocean tends to go other than the pH. Now, in the history, this is when we have very low magnesium up until about, uh, about the Carboniferous era, and that was all calcite as, as the corals were back then. And you can see when the the Triassic, when we had, after the Permian extinction, we had corals starting off, they were in an aragonitic ocean, and so our corals made aragonite. Now, why in the world they can't change with the ocean, I don't know, but it's hard to evolve making calcite versus aragonite for some reason. Well, you can see now, the continent slowed down, and now we're back up into the aragonite times. Uh, now, this doesn't, not, the corals can't, during the time that the oceans were moving fast, like during the dinosaur eras and stuff, it was mostly uh, calcite. And so the corals uh, didn't, after the middle of the Jurassic, see years, 
there was another mass extinction here, but the corals came back, and then it changed to a calcite ocean, and so the corals really didn't make very many reefs. It was the bivalves that made the reefs, and the corals lived on the bivalves because the bivalves were calcite. Now, the corals were doing fine, but they didn't make reefs. But they don't need reefs. They use the, the bivalves as reefs. And you can see here, the actual uh, <coughs> uh, diversity of corals was greater with no reefs, or very poor reefs, than they are now. Now is the next best to the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. But they weren't making reefs here. But there were more kinds of corals. So they were living, uh, I, I like this, a couple of people here at Hawaii once said, life obesity, a massive reef accumulation is a result of remaining stationary for too long under good conditions, is the, the eroders are not working as well and you're doing fine. The corals don't need reefs, although reefs might be good for corals. They live for most of the history of corals were not really with reefs. And so it's a byproduct. Just like I think for the stomatolites, they're probably a byproduct of the cyanobacteria. They're probably not the all. This is just a quick showing you had uh, uh, bivalves and things during calcite. Uh, here, here, I'm sorry, calcite reefs. Now, one thing I thought was especially interesting is during these extinctions here, as when corals started making reefs, it was very good condition. This is a ragonitic ocean. And you got fast growing branching corals would come out and they <coughs> over. Mound building corals were being swamped in the fossil record. But then when you had this big time with bad conditions, all of the fast growing ones disappeared. And the slow growing mound corals seem more tolerant. They're putting more. They're not growing as fast, but they're putting more in the fences. And they made it through, and then they started growing. But then a tremendous burst, because this was a ragged ocean here in the early Jurassic, and a lot of different kinds of genera suddenly appeared in those very few million years. And the, those that made the mound building tolerant ones that made it through the bad conditions may have been, they were, went extinct when corals got really good. When things became very good for corals, you got a lot of the fast growing kind and the slow growing went extinct. Now this <coughs> happened again when it turned, and the Jurassic turned to an aragonitic sea. And you didn't get many fast growing ones in a, I mean in a calcite sea, in a calcite sea. Now, at the Cretaceous extinction, which brought all the dinosaurs and things like that to extinction. The corals did better than those. And, uh, well, uh, but again, the branching ones, there, there's no branching ones started off. Every time you get branching ones, they go extinct when things are bad and new kinds come up. But we have some of the same genera coming all the way from the Cretaceous to now of the mound kind. Uh, that's the basic message is, that a lot of mound corals seem very tolerant of bad conditions. Fast growing co corals seem to evolve to grow fast and reproduce fast, but they <coughs> abandon a lot of their defenses. Uh, this is just pictures of the reefs or structures made by bivalves in a very large uh, <laughs> garbage can size uh, giant can clam like things are not related to our giant clam. They were painted in all sorts of shapes in the calcite ocean. And in Switzerland, uh, or not in Scotland, they're making it. I won't go into this. Now, here's a picture of the early uh, first coral in the Triassic Ocean. You can see the branching corals aren't really branching, but they're fast growing tubes. But they're not really branches. It's like each one is a polyp. That's called vasiloid. Dendroid is where you kind of have polyps coming off, but not real branches. And branching corals only originated basically like a, a cropper originated since the Cretaceous extinction. The branching corals start completely new every time there's a mass extinction. Well, that's just it. Now, here, these corals have been here since the Mesozoic. About two dozen kinds of coral, and notice they're all massive or encrusted. You don't get a single branching one that hasn't made it from there. 
Uh, Montastri has, has actually been from Jurassic. And so these things have been around uh, a long time. But the branching corals, they started recently, which is the best time for the time for corals, or in the Eocene or Paleocene. Now this is um, Astriopora. It's in the same family as the Acropora, which is the branching one, but it made it from the Cretaceous. The, the family was there, but they weren't branching. It was, this is a very tolerant coral. And this is Diploastria, it's also from the Cretaceous. And this is my favorite. That's an octocoral. And you can't tell it physically. It seems to be the same species since it started in the early Cretaceous, 135 million years ago. Now, it's obviously got to be a different species. But the fossils are named a different name if it's in another geological period, and that's probably right. But you can't actually show there's a difference. Now, <clears throat> corals are getting better. Because during the Triassic mass extinction, which is only about 20 <coughs> million years after they started, uh, only 27% of the genera survived. And for the animal in general, 53% uh, survived of marine ge animal genera, but only 27%. About the same number of marine genera survived the Cretaceous extinction, but now it's 70%. So they're in much better shape after the Cretaceous, which, by the way, was a bad time for making reefs, but it was a good time for getting coral. And then also, 55% of those that survived the extinction also survived when it got really good for corals to grow. So they were able to hold their own. Montastri and Diploastri and those are able to survive a proper fast growth and stuff like that. Only 5% made it uh, when things started getting good. Now, the Neogene, which is a time we're in are just at the end, it's the Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene, it's the ice ages of uh, um, Antarctic separated from South America about the beginning of the Neogene, and you got this big current going around, and that current protected Antarctic ice. And so Antarctic ice has been there accumulated a long time, and this helps corals because it's um, We'll get into that if I have time. But the thing is, uh, the North Pole is it's, it's not protected. And so it only became icy about two million years ago, and very recent. And it's also going to go fast. Uh, the South Pole will last a lot longer than the North Pole because it's protected by that circumpolar current. The North Pole is going to get free of ice pretty quick. And it's, it's only two million years versus about 23 million years. So the South Pole is ice is about 10 times as old. But what's really good about here, about the beginning of the Neogene here, is during the Cretaceous, the um, atmospheric CO2 was in the thousands, about three and a half thousand parts per million. And uh, now it's about 400. But for most of the Neogene, it's, it's been about, uh, alternated between about 180 parts per million during the ice, when the ice is advancing, and then times like now, as the ice is retreated, uh, the interglacial period is about 280. And that's what it was up until the beginning of the, of the Industrial Revolution. But now it's about 400. So we're, we're going up here. This is an old picture, so it's probably about here now. And the same thing, the uh, pH would do the opposite. As you get less CO2 absorbed, uh, you get uh, higher pH. And so this is old to new, it's kind of bad, because this is where we are now. But the uh, pH is better around over 8, whereas most of the rest <coughs> of the Earth's history, it's been down below. It's never been acidic. And you should never say the ocean is acidic or going to be because it's never been acidic. It's acidification, you might say, because it's going in that direction. But it never got below seven. So 
continents are not moving much, and so and there's abundant because of that. There's abundant magnesium, so the Pleistocene is really good for corals, better than it's ever had. And there's low P CO2 until now, and our high pH. The carbonate is available in seawater because there's low CO2. The high saturation state allows easy, easy for the corals. It's like going downhill. Uh, the oceans are cool, right around 28 degrees for most of the Neogene. Uh, the sea level rising is a good thing. I'll show you why. The reason is because uh, you're causing speciation with, with the up and down, over and over, interglacial, glacial, interglacial, glacial. And in the last, uh, in the Pleistocene, we've gotten up to 170 species of a cropper and 72 species of Montipra, which are the same family, in a very short amount of time. Now, they evolved in very good times. So what I'm thinking is they've never experienced global warming. Like, like the uh, mound corals. They were there for the Cretaceous extinction made it through. They were there for the, there was a paleogenic <coughs> thermal maximum where it got the water, things got pretty hot. They made it through that. There was a major extinction in the Caribbean. They made it through that. And so I think they're going to make it. But we've got a lot of, it's been so good for corals that we've got a lot of diversification of especially the fast growing kinds in recent years. And they may have lost all their energy. <laughs> Here's why uh, every time you get a glacial period, a lot of the water goes up out of the ocean into the ice caps. When that happens, the sea level drops. And as you can see, the Indian Ocean is basically separated from the Pacific for about 100,000 <coughs> years. Now, in 100,000 years, the corals can get genetic drift or they can adapt to new things. They could be different genetically now. So, you know, when the interglacial comes and this floods again, they're reconnected. They might hybridize or they might be selected not to hybridize because they're too different and it doesn't work well. But it makes for a lot of diversification. So as the water goes up, separates them down for 100,000 years connected, 100,000 years disconnected, um, it, it's good for speciation. But I think it's luring them into, uh, this is Charlie Barron, the uh, most famous living coral reef person. Uh, he said, this, he pictured it like this. When the corals are separated, they might drift apart, and they might come back, and they might separate forever, somewhere along the line, but they might come back. And, but, and corals are very difficult to identify a lot because there's hybridization involved in, uh, I'm going to skip over this because we're running out of time. What I want to do is get to, uh, oh, uh, one thing that was noticed is, um, uh, I will go back here. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I, I, I guess I will talk about this. They've done studies that, that showed that the amount of recruits in all up and down many, many studies at a place is not related to the amount of surface cover of living coral. It's, it's not related at all. But what it is related to is not how many corals are, but how fecund they are. And you can see here, as a percent grad of coral goes up, the number of recruits goes way up. So uh, there's a lot of reasons fecundity can decrease. First is corals, especially the mound corals, the mound corals, not the branching corals, are long-lived and they're adapted to hold on until the conditions get better because if you send out larvae now, they're going to die. It's hard enough for a grown-up to stay alive. Don't send out larvae now. Now, I'm, I'm being talking teleologically. It's not, they don't plan things or do, but this is what's been selected for is to survive. You're selected to survive. And so physiological stress, they put the energy of producing eggs, uh, shunt it over to surviving and repairing tissue damage, fighting disease, and so on. Uh, now, as the population goes down, even, uh, the, even though there's more pecan here, uh, they disperse 
less because there's a certain percentage goes out and it's, it's a percentage thing, not an absolute number that goes out there. So there are lots of reasons Connect, connectivity among the populations will go down when the fecundity goes down. But what's interesting, this picture was taken by one of our grad students here. Uh, they studied co tagged corals and found after a bleaching event, so much energy was put into survival and repair that the corals did not reproduce for four years after the event, even if they didn't bleach. It's still, uh, they have to use energy to not bleach as well as to repair if they bleach. So there's a lot of, um, well, fecundity goes down and <coughs> goes down. Now, oh, here, here's some, like tissue damage can suspend gamete production for several years. Uh, temperature induced bleaching in one season to prevent completion of the, of the yeah, endogenic cycle following year, and so on. Uh, now, a proper and fast growing corals do not seem to be adapted to survival. They're, they're going for fast growth. And, well, that's the um, relative that made it through the mutation. Now, a cropra is the most diverse genus and it's very fast growing. You have these axial polyps. That's why it's called acropora. It's a big pore on the tip. But then they have uh, po uh, radial polyps all around. And they are very fast growers, and they are really dominate under good conditions. All of these are in the genus Acropora. The branching ones here too. This is a Acropora. This is a Acropora. This fingers here are Acropora. They just take over. And this is only six years old. It's a lava flow. And I'm going back to this place after 24 years. This is a picture was taken uh, 24 years ago, and I'm going to go see it in April just for fun. Just nuts science, but I just want to see how this is coming. But uh, this is only six years old. You can see they're really fast growing. And this is in uh, Pongo Pongo Harbor after they took some sewage. <coughs> now, the thing that's interesting is they don't defend themselves. They just put all their energy into growth. For example, most coralivores love to eat a cropper. You can see here what a coralivore starfish is doing just cleaning out <coughs> all of it. There's uh, tw 28 genera of, of corals are preyed on. 83 have never been seen preyed on, but a cropper is preyed on by just about <coughs> everything. There's uh, 128 species of fish that are coralivores, at least partially, and 314 species, but they don't defend themselves. And look what happens. You would think after a crown of thorns, there'd be selection for one that was a little less tasty. They don't have but look how fast they grow. This is the same place a uh, few years later. Another thing is, proper doesn't really repair itself. It's, well, it grows so fast, it's not worth its time fixing. Uh, they're very porous because they can really grow up fast. This makes them weaker in resisting wave action. And you can see here, this is a plate of uh, uh, tabletop coils. But they come back fast too. This is the same place. Right? This is the same place we just saw. Very fast growing. They also, they're, they're much branching corals, are much thinner tissue. These are branching corals, and these are massive protective corals that are <coughs> adapted to survive. And these are adapted to grow fast. And even the percent nitrogen in the tissue of the branching corals are much less than the percent nitrogen and carbon. It's a much, their tissue is not only much thinner, but it's also a more dilute soup, you might think of it. And they're also very, um, very vulnerable to bleaching. These are the ones that are least vulnerable. These are the most vulnerable. And you can see the crop are right up there. Also, they're larvae live less. Now, but this is the reason it's good. Here's a mound coral in Palau, and there's another one. You can see what happens when conditions are good, the branching coral does. And I think we're out of time. The main point here is history has shown that our mound corals are really getting pretty good because they've made it through some really bad mass extinctions, probably worse than we're going to take the world. The branching corals don't. I'm thinking probably 
they're not going to stay this is I don't know, but we're not going to make briefs very well and um, I'm out of time, but I find anyway, I think the massive corals are selected to survive and then reproduce when things get better. A cropper Many of the species evolved very recently have never seen that time. They're adapted to grow very fast and not worry about defending against predators or against disease or things like that. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I'm taking pictures over. Time.